for joining us here this afternoon. Uh, I want to give you some updates and where we stand on some various issues. Our task force met this morning. I'm sure some of you are aware of that. And first off, I want to give a shout out and a thank you to the task force members, to everybody that made uh, presentations, those that participated through public comment or various ways. Uh, task force is helping us navigate uh, through some of these uncharted waters, and we appreciate that and uh, continue, we'll look forward to continuing working with them. It's hard for me to imagine, but Saturday will mark six months since our first case in the state of Nevada. Six months, and it sometimes feels like six years. Uh, a lot is accomplished in, in six months. A lot's been done, and we've had to work our way through that. Uh, it's been overwhelming for our state, for our country, for our community, and has resulted in many, many sleepless nights for me and for an awful lot of people in our community and in our country. I know that mentally and emotionally, we all want this to be over and to get back to normal, uh, whatever our new normal is going to be. That's what I want as well. Every single morning I wake up, I come in, and the first thing I ask my staff for is our statistics from the night before, from the day before. You know, our positivity ratios, our hospitalization counts, our deaths, and so forth. I want to see those positivity ratios go down. I want to see the test numbers go up. Certainly want to see the deaths go down. Uh, I want to see positive trends. And I want to be able to reduce, modify, and lift some restrictions as we move forward. Right now, our numbers are trending in the right direction. But that being said, you need to understand that we started at an extremely high level when we started bringing our numbers down. So we have a long way to go, considering the fact that we started so high. Uh, our case numbers are decreasing. So is our seven-day average on positivity, which is extremely important. It's one of the data points and metrics that we use most. This week, the Nevada hospitalization reported the lowest number of cases hospitalized since early July in intensive care unit uh, beds uh, occupied as a result of COVID since early July. We continue that downward trend as it relates to COVID-19 hospitalizations, which is extremely important and that's a good sign for us. I know that a lot of people that are listening, that are going to read and listen to what you say, are going to say, great, Governor, our numbers are good, so let's just open everything, everything back up and get back to normal. Well. Where our numbers are getting better, but we've got a long way to go. Uh, in our two high-risk counties, three high-risk counties, Clark, Elko, and Washoe, our numbers are still extremely high. Nevada is one of only 11 states in the country that still has a positivity rate above 10 percent. Uh, we have to do better. We have to get that positivity number down, and we will continue to work to that regard. It's imperative that that number come down. I've learned a lot in the last six months. My team has learned a lot. The COVID task force has learned a lot. Our doctors and scientists have learned a lot, both on analysis, on treatment, and on mitigation. One of the things that I've learned and the lesson that sticks with me is we have to be careful in our reopening and aggressive in our mitigation. Uh, we flattened the curve before. You remember that. We reopened and we spiked. And as a result of that, we had to put restrictions further back into place. Just a month ago, a little over a month ago, Southern Nevada hospitals were reaching near capacity. I mean, we were at a point where we didn't have any more hospital beds or close to no more hospital beds available. We can't do that again. We can't go back. We can't afford to get back in that position again. Uh, at this six-month point, remember when we lift restrictions, when we lift restrictions, we must lift those restrictions responsibly. Our future economic recovery depends on it, and our community depends on it. People ask, are we on the path to improvement? The answer is yes, we're definitely on the path to improvement. And I do. They say, are you optimistic? Are you pessimistic? I'm definitely an optimistic. We're moving in the right direction. And we're moving in the right direction because our community, our state, our citizens have participated and they've helped. Certainly there's naysayers out there that protest and don't want to wear a mask and object to this and that, but the vast, vast majority of our citizens are complying. They're wearing masks. They're practicing social distancing. They're avoiding large gatherings, and we ask them to continue to do that. And I know for some of our local leaders, this can be tough. It can be real tough. Trust me, I get it. I was there. I come from local government. I understand the pressure that they're under, and I know everyone is doing their best 
for their communities in a situation for which there's no playbook, there's no guidelines in how to get through this. I get the desire for there to be a lot of finger pointing. I wish there was a federal program in place. I wish there was a unified national strategy. There isn't. And it doesn't do me any good to point the finger at somebody else because there isn't. We have to work together and work in cooperation with each other in order to get where we need to get to. It's easy to be a sideline critic, a Monday morning quarterback, an internet troll, whatever you want to call it. If I was sitting on the outside, I'd be criticizing too. And social media makes that very easy for people to do with their anonymity. And it's unfortunate that they do not understand that sometimes the people they're attacking are the ones that shouldn't be attacked, but we need to get working together in order to make progress. Some of the things that have happened are certainly worthy of critique. I accept that. We're not perfect, but we're trying to get better. We're trying to do everything we can. And you have my commitment that we will continue to try to improve as we move forward. We can disagree. That's okay. And I expect local leaders to advocate for their local communities. That's their job. I expect that they might not always agree with policies that we put in place. But all of our citizens are worthy of being represented and being worthy of cared about and none of our citizens belong living homeless or in the dirt, as it were. Uh, they deserve to be treated with dignity and respect. Uh, everything I do focuses on our statewide response and the consideration of consequences of decisions now and into the future. The impacts we felt have been real. We had to cut our budget by 25%. One quarter of our state budget got slashed as a result of COVID-19. Hardworking Nevadans have lost their jobs. Nevadans have lost their houses. Businesses continue to struggle and many of them have been forced to close. I want to reassure everyone that my primary focus is on improving the numbers that we deal with so that we can reduce restrictions and come out of this better. I want all businesses to reopen. I want to get back to normal. I want to get schools back to normal. That's the goal. I want to focus on our economic recovery plan. How do we protect what we have and how do we recover for the future? And as governor, I want to make sure that the rest of the country takes Nevada seriously, and that we keep our workers safe and make sure our visitors feel safe coming here. I have to consider our hospitality industry. It provides the largest number of jobs and helps fund our state. I have to make sure that leaders in other states have confidence in sending their residents here. If they think our numbers are too high, they're not going to take the risk. They'll place travel restrictions on people coming to Nevada or force a mandatory quarantine when the residents return. I deal with our Western Alliance governors on a regular basis. I talk to them on the phone. We have conference calls. We're part of a working group. You have to understand that the contemplation or the consideration on the travel ban of people coming to Nevada, I wouldn't have to put any more restrictions and shut down businesses in the Strip. It would shut down automatically if our neighboring and our sister states imposed that type of restriction. I'm communicating with the governors, expressing to them that we're doing everything we can to keep our citizens safe, our tourists safe, and their citizens safe. That's why we're taking some of the steps that we have taken. That threat we face, if we don't get this right, that we could suffer worse economic damage. It's not just my reality, it's Nevada's reality. It's made some of these really tough decisions, some that break my heart, frankly, to have to make some that I lose sleep over that don't come easily. We have to stay on track and think of the long-term economic consequences every time we make a decision. If we go too fast, in recovery will be hindered. And things like conventions won't just be canceled this year, they'll be canceled next year too, and the year after that. And we will lose convention business. We can't afford to do that. We can't afford to let that happen. And I know how some of this can feel to all of you. It can feel overwhelming. Testing, 
criteria, mitigation. The CDC says one thing, then they say something else. It's frustrating a lot of folks. It's frustrating for me. We have to deal with the most up-to-date information and policies that we have, and we will continue to do that. It's overwhelming for a lot of you out there, folks out there with kids. You're trying to figure out how to log on to your computer for their kid's Zoom class at school and figure out if your claim went through a Dieter at the same time. I know how difficult that can be. I've got two daughters that I helped, that I raised as a single dad. I've got a wife and a 93-year-old mother that's left the house one time in 24 weeks. One time she's been able to go out of her house for a doctor's appointment. That's it. And the one thing she misses most is going to church. And I totally understand that. We all understand that. I hear this frustration from my fellow citizens. In the past six months since science has developed, and they've developed a lot, we should review to see what measures we should continue, what measures we should not, and what, what measures should be changed. As a result, I've asked my team to evaluate our current statewide standards and restrictions and determine what best practices are what should be implemented, what should be removed, what should be changed. And I look forward to sharing that information with you as it's developed. These are a few of the areas that we're working on and what we're going to actively work on with our public health experts to, as we agree to loosen some things. They still consider elevated risk factors in each area of our state, but I want to make progress anywhere we possibly can. We're reviewing how we approach capacity levels at certain venues. We've been researching different approaches in terms of how to do that and using best practices that have been developed in other states. Trust me, I want to get back to church. I want to go back to Mass Live instead of watching it on my phone every weekend. I want church services to be able to expand their limit. I want businesses to be able to have business meetings there in spaces that are large enough to keep people space. That's what I've asked our folks to look at right now. We are working on this and we want to get it right. I want youth sports to be able to start up again. I don't want our athletic teams, our youth sports teams to travel out of sight where they're going to have an issue with coming back and with restrictions in a neighboring state. That's not what we should be doing. In the last few months, there's been a lot of inconveniences, a lot of sacrifices, and a lot of really hard times. I want to take, into, take just a few moments to reflect on those first 30 to 45 days of this pandemic and the crisis that we're facing. Remember when we were competing with other states to buy PPE? We were bidding against each other to buy masks and gowns and gloves. We had a confusion on tests. Which ones worked? Which ones didn't work? Do we make our own? Where do we buy them? How do we get them? I remember calls I took in the middle of the night getting tests through customs coming from Abu Dhabi through our task force at work. They went around the world to purchase tests for us, to work, purchase PPE, and to keep our community safe. The county was constructing tents to try to shelter our homeless population. Hospitals were making plans to build out new structures. In Reno and Renown, they were building a parking, the parking garage. We were having a plan to put beds in the parking garage. That's the case that we were in at the beginning 30 to 45 days. We closed our schools, we closed our businesses, and we closed our resort industry. It wasn't that long ago that we did this. So much has happened all at once. It's hard to remember the chaos the total chaos, the unknown, and we've come a long way. We've come a long way because the community pulled together. They provided food for people that didn't have food. They helped neighbors do their shopping if they weren't able to get out. They helped everybody that needed help. The support was there for those that were most desperately in need. The true Nevada really showed up when we were facing our most dire times. And I'm proud of every single Nevada that did that that accomplished so much, that saved, helped so many people save lives. There's a pride we have in looking out for each other, a pride that we saw on 1 October, a pride that we see again as we work our way through this pandemic. We need to focus on the long-term benefits uh, on this recovery. It'll be better. It'll be more successful. 
I know it's hard to imagine right now, but it will be. That day is coming, and hopefully soon. If any state is going to come back stronger, it's going to be this one. It's going to be Nevada that comes back strong. We have to meet this moment together, and I'm proud of what people in the state have done. I know a great majority, a great majority of people in Nevada, of our Nevadans, have rallied together. They might be upset with me on some things that I've done, some decisions that I've had to make, but that hasn't stopped them from sticking together and doing the right thing. That hasn't stopped them from helping their neighbors. I'm proud that people are wearing masks. I'm proud of the hand sanitation. I'm proud that people are willing to compromise and not have large gatherings and their social distancing. And before I take some questions, I want to remind everybody, tomorrow starts Labor Day weekend, official end of summer. And normally it's a part time where people get together, they go to the lake, they have big barbecues, they have big parties. I'm going to ask you one more time, please don't do that. Please celebrate with your immediate family. You know, have a cookout in your backyard, watch some TV, whatever it might be. But please do not have large gatherings. That is the single most uh, expansive spread of the COVID virus, is the family gatherings and the neighborhood gatherings that are done in backyards. Please help us get through this next weekend. We had a major setback after Memorial Day weekend. We had another one after the 4th of July. And this is our third big one of the summer. And we're asking you to please be extra cautious as we approach this Labor Day weekend. Some folks have lost faith, faith in, their test, in testing. I understand that. I read the article that 80 NFL players tested positive, and the next day they said that all the tests were contaminated. They were all negative. People were going for a test, and it was taking them 10 days to get the results back. I understand the frustration. I get it. But right now, we have an opportunity through working with FEMA and Dr. Burks to have 60,000 tests, 60,000 tests administered in 14 days. We started on Monday, the 31st, and it'll run for 14 days. They're at Texas Station. Sam Boyd and the Fiesta in Henderson, I believe, are the three sites that are doing that. It's free. It's called Stop, Swab, and Go. And there is a three to five day turnaround on those test results. Please get a test. Please stay safe. I encourage you to take advantage of that. And one more thing I'm going to bring up for those of you who have not signed up for it we have an app called COVID Trace on your phone. This is the most effective app that we have in terms of contact tracing. If everyone had this app, we could contact trace much faster. You're automatically, it's free to download. You're automatically notified if someone that you have been near, has, you've been exposed to, has tested positive. This can help us stop the spread. So if you don't have the COVID, tra COVID trace app, please get it put on your phone. Uh, thank you for joining me this afternoon. I'd be happy to take some questions if anybody has any. Thank you, everyone. We have a, a microphone stand up here. That will help the folks at home hear the questions. Yeah, we had, a, we had a problem with the folks at home not hearing the questions. And frankly, I'll be honest, I'm not good at repeating them. So if you go to the stand, it will help. Sure. Um, hello, Governor Mary Hines, Review Journal. Um, first, I wondered if you could clarify for me action taken by the task force this morning. Mm -hmm. Um, lifting restrictions on countertops in restaurants right. and as I understand it also bar tops in bars that serve food would that be correct no there's not a change in restriction on bar tops with gaming machines that serve food that that still remains something that they can't have mm. what we're talking about is in and this is I think it's more of a clarification than it is a change I think the example that I use if you go in a sushi bar or you go in a you know uh, breakfast kind of place, I guess, has it. Some lunch places do countertop seating where you go. That's always been allowed if there's social distancing at the counter. So you can go, you can sit on a counter stool and order your breakfast and your coffee, and it's not somebody right next to you. If you have six feet, you can have that. That's now been clarified. I guess there was some misunderstanding that that is allowable. Okay, but you cannot do that at bars with food, even if there aren't gaming devices at the bar top? Well, the 
the uh, prohibition we had is the gaming on the bar top. I, I'm not familiar with whether or not you can do it at the bar if there's no machines in the bar. Most of the bars have machines in the bar. Mary, we can follow up with you separately on that. Do you want to go to the next question? Okay. okay. Um, can I just ask a second let's, part? Let's go to someone else and we'll do it. We'll, we'll come, come back, back to you. Time. Okay. Hi, Governor. Yeah. Given the extension in the eviction moratorium, right. are you contemplating any protections for homeowners or landlords who are private landlords who own properties and can't make their payments? And renting them, yeah. What we're trying to do is get the money out on the street faster. Uh, we're trying to work with the landlords that come to us instead of the tenants necessarily coming to us. We made sure that any of those funds, those resources, go directly to the landlord mm -hmm. so that the landlord can make the payment. If the landlord has five tenants, for example, that aren't paying, that they could come and maybe file one application to get uh, remuneration for those five tenants and make their payments. We do understand that it is putting an enormous strain on the uh, property owner. Are and you confident that you'll be able to do that before there are any defaults filed? We're sure trying. We're sure trying. If somebody has a problem, I've got the treasurer's office and the attorney general willing to step in and try to help us and negotiate or mediate some of those situations. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Governor. Joe Bartels, Channel 13. My question was about the lost wages program and right. Nevada's timing of applying for it, even though we're the highest in the nation mm -hmm. uh, with that. Why the timing and why did it take so long? Frankly, you know, the timing situation, it's unfortunate we couldn't get it done quicker. It came through Dieter, and as you understand, Dieter right now, the biggest thing I'm facing is trying to work through a backlog of cases. I talked with Secretary Scalia this morning as it relates to the lost wages. I'm confident we will get approved. He's confident we will get approved. Uh, it will provide the extra $300. We do not have the resources uh, to add the $100 on, but it will get $300. One of the things we're facing that people, uh, I want you to try it, want people to try to understand. We inherited uh, a Dieter system, an unemployment system that was antiquated to begin with. The Secretary and I had this discussion this morning that most systems in the country never were set up to handle anywhere near this kind of a volume or never were set up with the most updated uh, technological advances. That's an area that the past, I'm not blaming it on any other governor or any other administration, it just wasn't a focus of a lot of funding. And I think that if this uh, pandemic, one thing it's done is it's obviously amplified our weaknesses, and that's one of them. Thank you, Governor. Thanks. Thank you, Megan. Governor Sasha Loftus, Channel 8, Las Vegas. Um, my question's regarding schools. Obviously, a big frustration here locally with Clark County School District. A lot of students don't have access to Chromebooks or to Internet access. Um, I know a lot of people have been raising money. The Clark County School District drafted a bill to the legislature to, you know, bring more uh, electronics to students. Is there any plan on a state level to help with funding or help with access to that for students? Right. And this is one of the things that... Uh, I want you to understand that always comes that it, if it's not working, it's because of something that we did or didn't do. I mean, it happened yesterday, two days ago, with the Ember Alert. We have nothing to do with Ember Alerts. It was a county Ember Alert. Uh, we are working with all of our school districts. Uh, we we uh, designated them as being the point person to decide what the right methodology is. Some of our smaller districts, if you get up into, you know, White Pine or Esmeralda or, you know, some of the smaller counties, Elko, you can have in-person schooling and is going well in some of these areas. It's going very well. The two big ones, obviously Washoe and Clark, uh, it's a problem. And here again, they were not set up for distance education at the level that we're facing right now. I've read some of the numbers and the fact that there's, I mean, estimates of 70, 80,000 kids do not have access or do not have a device, have not signed in yet 20% of the total uh, school population is a very, very big concern. But that's something that we left to the superintendent and the school boards, and we will support them in any way possible. We did get CARES Act money that they got allocated to them for the purchase of those devices, and I don't know what their plan is, but we're supporting them in what they do and gave them the autonomy to make those decisions. Thank you. Thank sure. You. Hi, Governor. You, you said your team is reviewing all of the kind of restrictions we have right now. Can you clarify if that's different than the task force process that's going on and what exactly the review is? Well, the task force that met this morning is that the task force reviews uh, the counties that come forward with plans uh, and what they are and what they're going to do, what they're asking for in terms of reduced restriction, 
and what they're offering in terms of more mitigation to prevent the spread. My team being, you know, my senior staff, my entire, uh, our different departments, whether that's uh, business and industry, whether that's GoEd, whether the, whoever that might be, that uh, OSHA, as we relate to what restrictions. There are areas we would clearly like to make uh, adjustments, maybe, it would be the best word, in the restrictions, and that would include our houses of worship, that would include youth sports, that would include allowing some of these businesses to have small meetings in a restaurant or in a meeting facility where they could host X number of people depending on the capacity in a safe manner. We're going to try to come up with a way using best practices across the country to make sure that we can get people to do that. Is live entertainment one of those areas? Not live entertainment where you're talking about a venue where people have to pay to go into. You know, if we're talking about a, a football game or a Golden Knights game or a Raiders or, you know, where that might be, that's not something we're doing. We're not having concerts that people are going to come in where you pay to go in. Uh, so those wouldn't be included. Showrooms are not being considered right now either. Thank you. Certainly. I go ahead. So you had mentioned that at the like, sites like the Fiesta Henderson and Sam Boyd, uh, the testing was taking about three to five days to come back. Right. Um, obviously, the sooner, you know, the better with that turnaround right. time. Is there a specific turnaround time that the state is, is working towards that's a goal for the state? Yeah, um, the goal for me is to between 24 and 48 hours to get them turned around. Now, these are a little longer because this is a FEMA program that came in. You know, they brought in everything. They brought in the tests. They brought in resources. They brought in the people. And they're not even having, in my understanding, having been processed necessarily in Nevada. They're taking them to their lab to get processed, so that's adding a day onto that. But the goal would be to get these done in uh, one to two days, 24 to 48 hours. A lot is happening on the testing front. We're briefed regularly. Uh, the new Abbott quick test that you've seen a little bit about, uh, the card that's uh, $5 wholesale, and you uh, do the nasal swab, and you put in a couple drops on in the test, you get a result in 15 minutes. Right now, the FDA has uh, preliminary approved it for symptomatic individuals, but they haven't got the approval on asymptomatic uh, individuals yet. There's a lot more rapid testing coming down the line, and when I mean rapid, they're usually in the 15 minute. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I got Mary's got a follow up too. Okay. Hello, Alejandro Condis, Telemundo. Uh, Governor, the CDC is telling states to prepare for large, large scale distribution of the coronavirus vaccine by November 1st. Are you going to work on this and how? Yeah, absolutely. We're, uh, uh, what they've done uh, to us, they've sent us a, uh, a notification and some information that McKesson is the company, I believe, that's been selected by the federal government to make the distribution of the vaccines when they become available. What would normally have to happen is that uh, McKesson would have to get licensure in the various jurisdictions that we're talking about, the community, county, city, the state, whatever, to set up a facility and to provide those. They're asking us to all work with McKesson and either limit or streamline that application process. Uh, we have a policy of procedure in place where we'd be able to give uh, the vaccines, whether that's at uh, some of the sites we've set up permanently, like the one right across the street at Cashman Field. Uh, but there's a lot of unknown questions. I'm on regular calls with the vice president's office. You know, there's several companies that are fast-tracking their vaccine. And a lot of this is going to depend on how many you're going to get, who's going to get them first. We've had discussions. It's my uh, concern that we get health care workers and public safety workers on the front line. Teachers need to be right up there in the first folks in our vulnerable population that could get it first. Thank you, Governor Jacob Solis, Nevada Independent. Um, I want to ask about colleges and, the, and their role in spreading COVID-19. We've seen college towns across the country be affected uh, by students spreading the disease at, at parties that are not masked and not socially distanced. We've already seen in Reno a, a concern that this is already happening at UNR. Uh, are you confident that state and local health authorities really have the capacity to track and identify any outbreaks at colleges in Nevada? Well, the app that I showed you on my phone is one of the areas that would help us tremendously is on the colleges because all these kids have uh, a cell phone that, you know, obviously can, the app can be attached to. Uh, it's not the institute or the higher education that's spreading the virus. It's a, the behavior of the students when they get to school. Now, I went to school a long time ago, understand, and things changed a little bit since then. But it's the big parties that get together, the fraternity, sorority parties, the bars off campus that have parties and whatnot. And 
we're encouraging them not to do that. They don't uh, understand the implications sometimes. I mean, you've read the articles. I, you know, you've got a lot of you folks are publishing them with a, a wedding in Maine that had a spread, and the different universities have a thousand positives in two days when these things happen. It just spreads like fire. The, uh, the virus is looking for a way to spread, and we have to do everything we can to prevent that from happening. So I've talked to, spoken to the chancellor. I had a call with the president at UNLV yesterday and dealing with uh, President Johnson last week at UNR. They have to help us. They have to do what they can to prevent these parties from happening on or around campus because that's where it's coming from. Great. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. We appreciate it. We'll follow up with you, Mary. Uh, Governor, okay. you willing to take another question? We'll follow up with you outside, Mary. You guys okay? Circling back? I'd rather ask a question. Well, I have the governor. Go governor. ahead. I'll take two more. Go ahead. Thanks. Thank you, Governor. I really appreciate it. I'm going to be in trouble it. as soon as I walk out of here. For this oh, well, time. you won't be in trouble with me. So I really appreciate it. So um, the county was pressing today to open playgrounds, youth sports, churches. I know you want those things, too. Could we be seeing that in a matter of weeks, months, and what will our numbers need to look like? Uh, I don't have an there? exact number that you need to get to. I don't have a metric that I can say if we reach this, you're going to get there. And I don't have an exact date. I can tell you that the items you mentioned are our priorities, you know, the youth sports, the churches, uh, those sort of things, the meetings. We're going to get there as quickly, but as responsibly as we possibly can. So we're going to continue to monitor best practices across the country. and and uh, hopefully our numbers keep going in that direction. Fair enough, thank, thank you. you. Okay, Dan, this is it. Off topic, Governor. Can you tell me, uh, Judge Gonzalez has ruled that the state overstepped its bounds and broke the law when it ignored the background checks for the marijuana licensees with less than 5% interest. Do you have any idea how that can be rectified now? I, I do not. Uh, I understand that Judge Gonzalez made a ruling today. I haven't been briefed on the ruling yet. I've got some of my counsel in the room now that were intimately involved in that. And thank you, Kyle, for the work you did on that. We appreciate you in fighting that. Obviously, you understand when this happened, I was on the county commission, and there was a lot of questions about the process. Uh, I commend Judge Gonzalez for that. It was a very difficult, complex case, I guess they call it, in, in the court world, you know, to, to be doing it at conventions, and there's so many lawyers involved. Uh, we'll read the decision and take her advice. and. I have utmost respect for her and go from there, but I can't comment. I haven't read it. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it, everybody. Have a great day.